everyone, and thanks for watching this News 8 special report on the coronavirus. I'm Eric Connert. And I'm Stella Escobedo. We do want to thank you so much for joining us today. So the goal of this hour is to answer all of your questions. Many of you have been emailing us, calling us. So today it is all about facts and not fear. So here is what we will be discussing in the next hour. How and where did the coronavirus start? How is it transmitted and what does it do to your body? Can my pet get the virus? And how do I explain social distancing to a loved one suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia? Those are just a few of the many topics we're going to be discussing. Eric. Thanks, Della. So let's start from the very beginning. What do we know about the origins of the virus? UC Davis professor Tracy Goldstein breaks it all down. So we've been trying to understand for the last 10 years a little bit about the circumstances where um, these viruses are able to be shed and spread and what sort of species have the different types of viruses. Dr. Tracy Goldstein's the director of the UC Davis One Health Institute which attempts to prevent disease rather than just react to it. What do we know about the origins of COVID-19? Right, so we don't know for sure about this virus, but based on the other viruses in the same group, we suspect heavily that it comes from bats. I think that one of the things that has become clear from the analysis is back in China, the virus mutated or changed um, from a bat to go into either an intermediate host or into a person probably in October or maybe early November. And so, you know, it sort of was circulating for a little while before we knew that there was a problem. Dr. Goldstein admits viruses emerge periodically over time. I think that these outbreaks are probably inevitable. What we can do is be better prepared to really understand the circumstances that they might be occurring in. And before the outbreaks occur, be able to put special, um, you know, stops in place. Most experts agree the coronavirus, COVID-19, likely originated from a live animal market in Wuhan, China. So, for example, if we think that mixing is occurring in high-risk markets, change the market so that we can prevent that. You know, so understanding how these things will will um, will circulate and, and put stops in place beforehand is going to be much more effective than trying to prevent an outbreak that's already, you know, full blown is what we're seeing right now. While the outbreak started in China, the bulk of cases and fatalities are now outside the country and the virus is spreading internationally. Stella. So what are the symptoms of the coronavirus? They include a fever, cough, shortness of breath. Symptoms may appear in as few as two days or as long as 14 days of exposure. If you're experiencing symptoms, call your health care provider before seeking medical care so that uh, appropriate precautions can be taken. And you hear us referring to the coronavirus as COVID-19. What does that mean? Why do we keep saying that? COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. The World Health Organization announced the official name this year. The name reflects the genetic similarities between the new coronavirus and the coronavirus that caused the SARS outbreak of 2002 and 2003. And it is important to note that people of all ages can be infected by COVID-19. Older people, people with pre-existing medical conditions such as asthma, diabetes, and heart disease appear to be more vulnerable to becoming severely ill with the virus. The World Health Organization is asking people of all ages to take steps to protect themselves from this virus. This includes following Following good hand hygiene and good respiratory hygiene. Eric. To help you better understand why coronavirus is so dangerous, we wanted to share a step by step look at what happens inside the body when it takes hold, and that's usually five to 12 days from infection. USA Today teamed up with several doctors to create these easy to follow graphics showing why we need to stay at least six feet away from each other. Nearby cough or sneeze droplets from someone who is sick enters primarily through your nose, but also through the eyes and mouth. Symptoms then start in the back of the throat with a dry cough, then comes a fever, muscle pain, and shortness of breath. But at this point, the symptoms are comparable to the flu, and this is where the coronavirus takes it a step further. It gets more severe when the infection goes down the windpipe and starts making its way into here, the lower respiratory tract. As it heads into the lungs, which are the major target, it can cause respiratory problems like bronchitis and pneumonia. That shortness of breath and coughing affects these tiny air sacs in the lungs here. Here's what a healthy air sac looks like, and here's how they look when they're inflamed by the virus and air space is filled with fluids. The airway just starts to swell, and then there's a decrease in airflow. That can lead to severe lung damage and the need for a ventilator. 
How many cases get this far? Well, the World Health Organization says the 14% of severe cases and 6% of critical cases are because the virus made its way down the windpipe into the lower respiratory tract. All this is a reminder to stay at least six feet away and keep washing your hands. Thank you, Eric. Very informative. So deadly diseases we know have existed for years, but how does this coronavirus outbreak compare? Our Marcella Lee takes a look. This gives you a good visual when it comes to the history of pandemics. I want to thank Visual Capitalist. Their graphic designers just sent this to me. First, here's the number of deaths on a timeline from the year 165 AD through the centuries. Here's the Black Death or bubonic plague in the 14th century. Here's smallpox. The larger the virus icon, the more deadly. Here's the Spanish flu and the HIV AIDS pandemic. And of course, today we are dealing with COVID-19. But let's scroll down for a closer look at the death toll from highest to lowest. The bubonic plague, which was spread by fleas, wiped out as many as 200 million people, about half of Europe's population in just a few years' time. Smallpox in the 1500s killed an estimated 56 million, the majority children. Then in 1918, the Spanish flu, roughly 40 to 50 million. And the plague of Justinian in 541 AD, about 50 million in the Eastern Roman Empire. We move down here to the fifth deadliest. Since 1981, AIDS has killed 25 to 35 million people. Several plague and flu pandemics have killed 1 to 12 million people. And we all remember this the swine flu just 10 years ago that killed 200,000 people. Yellow fever in the late 1800s killed about 100,000. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa, 11,000, and this is us right now. The death toll from COVID-19 is rising by the day. It currently stands at just under 9,000. The total has well surpassed that of MERS and SARS and is projected by some health officials to climb to more than a million if the coronavirus continues to spread at its current rate. But the hope is that the measures we are all taking to self-isolate and stay at home will keep the death toll much lower. So how long does it live? What surfaces does it live on? Still Ahead will continue to answer some of the biggest questions about the coronavirus. And you'll keep hearing the phrase, flattening the curve. We'll break down exactly what that means. Welcome back everyone. So here's a question we've been getting from our viewers. How long can the coronavirus live on surfaces? Thanks to researchers from the National Institutes of Health, the CDC, UCLA and Princeton, we know. But the answer can really vary depending on the type of service. If you walk by someone infected with the coronavirus, it isn't going to be suspended in the air from their breathing, but in a cough, the virus is shot up into the air. In that form, COVID-19 can last up to three hours. On plastic surfaces, it can live for three days. Same with steel and copper, four hours. The cardboard box, COVID-19 can last up to one day. So remember, keep your social distancing, wash your hands, and keep wiping down those surfaces. Let's work together to help flatten the curve and focus on the facts, not fears. Stella? Eric, we are all trying to stop the spread of germs, but it's very hard to do because you can't see it. William Pitts found a way to visualize the spread of coronavirus. You've heard of community spread. Well, what does that actually mean? We found a product that mimics what germs could look like if they're on your body. Community spread basically means a disease is spreading from person to person in a new area. And here's how easy it is. This powder simulates germs, like from a cough or a sneeze, and it glows under UV light. It's meant to simulate how germs can pass from person to person and still make you sick. The powder is basically just glowing baby powder. It's not real, it can't hurt anyone, but it's just like sneezing and forgetting to wash your hands after, which Dr. Andrew Carroll says you should never do. You should really be sneezing into the crook of your elbow, which is still not perfect because you're still spreading germs kind of all over, but at least you're not sneezing into your hands. First test, we put some in our office, like if someone had sneezed or coughed on a desk and got our first victim. Yeah, you my, got some glow going on there. Then I put some powder on my hands like I had sneezed and went back to work. Printing an email. Check out the paper for the day. High five to the assignment desk. And we'll go down. There they are. Look, that's a busy crew. Now, remember everything I just touched. 
we're going to hit it all with a black light. My mouse and keyboard glowing bright green. The printer, touchscreen, contaminated. I grabbed a newspaper, high five Seth behind there. Let's take a look at the newspaper. There's my handprints all over it. And let's take a look at Seth. The elevator buttons, the elevator door, even a regular door, all still glowing long after I put the powder on. And Dr. Carroll says that's how community spread works. It starts with one person and explodes from there. You go back to your desk, you touch the keys on your keyboard, and then you touch your mouse, and then from there you touch your phone. And then some guy comes around and uses your phone and now they've touched it. About 20 seconds of hand washing will take off pretty much any germs. The trick though is not touching your face, which if you're wondering, I did not succeed in doing. Again, washing your hands is key. And as you just mentioned, wash them for at least 20 seconds. If you do not have soap, use a hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Eric. Thank you, Stella. If you've spent any time online frantically looking for experts on infectious diseases, you probably run into the term flattening the curve. Chris Vanderveen was fascinated by this term and decided to explain the idea with the help of our graphics team at our parent company's Tegna Design Tank. Consider this line the upper limit of our country's medical capability. Most days, we're well below it. The system works well. People who are sick receive care. Enter COVID-19. Right now, the numbers are low, so low the system can handle it. Yet we know every person who gets the virus is likely to infect at least two other people. And that's why the numbers will continue to grow exponentially. Take Italy. In mid-February, the country had three cases and no deaths. The next week, more than 300 cases, 11 deaths. The next week, more than 2,500 cases and 80 deaths. The next week, more than 10,000 cases and 631 deaths. It's all pushed the country's healthcare system to its brink. This is what the U.S. will now attempt to avoid by trying to slow the spread over a manageable time. Infectious disease experts call it flattening the curve, and the more people who join, the flatter it gets. Sports fans who can't attend games, college students who won't attend class in person, canceled parades, conferences, concerts, people who wash their hands consistently, the sick who stay home. The more of us who sacrifice the norms of our daily lives, the more this works. Should this fail, people in this country, perhaps people you know, will unnecessarily die in a system that can't handle the spike. Health experts acknowledge COVID-19 appears to be at least 10 times deadlier than the flu, and those 65 and older are most at risk. But it's not all bad news. You have a role here. Yes, you. Remember, if you get sick, you're likely to infect two others if you don't change your behaviors. 80% of us who get sick will be fine, but even those who show mild symptoms will spread the virus. That's why you too need to join in, flatten the curve, avoid the quick spike, allow our medical system the ability to handle the cases that are coming because they are coming. Social distancing doesn't have to mean socially disconnecting, but as we stay close to home and away from others, how do you stay positive? Here's some advice. If you're working from home, keep your regular routine. Write out your regular schedule and stick to it. Take breaks, step away from your work to clear and settle your mind, and eat when you normally eat. Your mind and your body are used to routine. Also, go outside. Fresh air and daylight help reduce stress. Go for walks. Try not to sit all day. Get up and move around. Stretching or doing yoga can help as well. Other tips, stay in contact with friends and family. Share how you feel with them and ask how they're doing. You can also have an online party. Stella? Eric, there are now more than 5 million Americans living with Alzheimer's, so it could be very hard to explain to them what's going on. What is social distancing? Devin Haskins takes a look at this. Social isolation can be difficult for seniors in general and also those living with dementia or Alzheimer's. It's pretty difficult to say you can't see that person right now. Heidi Rowell is a program director for the Alzheimer's Association. She says there are ways to stay in touch with loved ones while still maintaining that safe distance. So I've heard of a lot of long-term care communities offering the option to do FaceTime, um, Zoom, um, any kind of video chat. These powerful images from across America prove it, showing families even communicating through windows. Hey there, old timer. How are you doing today? Oh. 
And for caregivers and family watching over those with dementia, Rowell has these tips for how best to explain why distance is necessary. First, keep the flow of information simple, not overwhelming. Just explaining to people that, you know, right now there's a virus going around. It's highly contagious. We want to stay inside. We want to wash our hands. We want to practice social distancing. Rowell says they are more likely to take risks because they forget normal procedures. So a little reminder can help. So certainly, especially people that are in the earlier stages of the disease, we recommend that caregivers leave notes in the bathroom reminding people to wash their hands. Um, you also can demonstrate good hand washing. Also have a month's worth of prescriptions on hand to limit unnecessary trips to the pharmacy. And for more information and advice, you can visit the Alzheimer's Association website. Eric, we just need a little bit more patience during yeah. times like this. And you can never be too prepared right now, that's for sure. Thanks, Del. I appreciate it. Still ahead, our news aides Kelly Hassadall talks to a patient with COVID-19. The treatment she is now testing to see if it does, in fact, cure the disease. A local lab is scrambling to get a COVID-19 vaccine out and on the market. It's a race against the clock, but every day, Innovio Pharmaceuticals is getting closer to releasing this urgent medicine. News 8's Neda Ranpour got the opportunity to go into the lab to learn about what they are creating. The eyes of the world watching and waiting for what comes out of this lab. Innovio Pharmaceuticals in Sorrento Valley taking on the crucial task of creating the COVID-19 vaccine. They've done it before for Zika and for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, known as MERS, even a vaccine for Ebola. It's something we are trained to do and say all the infrastructures here and the expertise is in-house. This was actually published uh, data from the Chinese scientists. When Chinese scientists released the virus's virus sequence on January and, 19th. Um, what they did, they isolated it and then they sequenced it. Innovio researchers got to work and within three hours they had a vaccine. We have an algorithm which we've designed and we can basically put that sequence into a our algorithm and come up with our DNA medicine in that short amount of time. Yes, it only took three hours for these smart minds to come up with what may stop the global spread of a deadly virus that has all but turned major neighborhoods in China into ghost towns. With tens of thousands in quarantine and suffering from this virus, the urgency of what these researchers are doing is not lost here. We're really laser focused on this one um, right now. So this is the plasmid production. Dr. Trevor Smith takes us into the lab to show us how they're creating this vaccine. So it all starts with this very tiny amount of DNA. They want what they call DNA medicine to multiply in dishes, vials and vats where yeast and bacteria all mix together to make even more medicine. And that's what's inside this brown liquid, which then turns into a paste. Once it's purified, it would then turn into this clear liquid solution containing that DNA medicine, which would then be used for the preclinical studies. And that's what's happening now. And Dr. Smith says so far so good. The vaccine has been tested on mice and guinea pigs. Then it'll be tried on a group of human patients. So how exactly does this vaccine work? Say it's like a piece of biological software meaning it would give your body instructions to create the proper attack in the form of T-cells and antibodies against COVID-19. And if all goes as planned, it may be available for mass public use by as early as this summer, which would be record time at Inovio. Netta Iranport, News 8. An Army veteran battling coronavirus has been keeping a diary of her illness on Facebook. She's doing it daily. Her name is Yvette Paz. She's from Huntington Beach. And under the supervision of her doctor, she is among the patients testing whether a drug to treat malaria is working. News Day's Kelly Hassadel spoke to her. She shares her story. Well, Yvette Paz's videos have been viewed on Facebook thousands of times. Now, she's been taking the drug hydroxychloroquine to see if it helps in the battle against COVID-19. I feel like there's a war going on inside my body right now. Army veteran Yvette Paz talks to us from her home in Huntington Beach. You'll start coughing and when you go to regain your breath, you feel like it's difficult to take in air. The 30 year old was diagnosed with coronavirus March 16th. And I was completely dumbfounded. She's been documenting her progress on Facebook for thousands of viewers. I am in the hospital out in Long Beach. At one point, she ended up in the hospital with severe pneumonia. 
There were moments she wasn't sure she would survive. <coughs> this is not something where you're, you're surrounded by loved ones. You don't have visitors. You're completely alone going through this. So if you can imagine just the mental wear that that does. Five days ago, she agreed to take part in a clinical trial with the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine. You do have to fit a certain description to even get it approved for use. Um, I happen to fit that mold. It's a very simple uh, medication to take. It's literally just a small pill that you take with water um, twice a day. Were you afraid at all, though? I mean, <laughs> with not knowing for sure if it works, if there are side effects? Absolutely. Um, I was. Um, but I think just it's, it's just been in me, you know, for as long as I, if I can help someone, I just feel like it's in my blood, it's in my bones. I want to do everything I can. The first day, I didn't really see much of a change. Day three, four, and five of this medication, I have been um, having spurts of energy. Like right now, the fact that I've talked this much is a huge deal. I haven't spoken this much in weeks, but I have this huge burst of energy, but then all of a sudden, I will have a really hard crash. I would say, at least from when I started it, that I'm feeling so much better, it's, but I'm definitely still fighting it. Paz says she'll never know where or when she contracted the virus, but points to two large events she attended recently, the Kobe Bryant Memorial at Staples Center and a red carpet movie premiere shortly after. Her message. I am coronavirus positive. I have pneumonia. I have lung damage and I am not afraid. I'm going to beat this. We're going to be okay. Now, Paz's relatives were tested for COVID-19. Their test results came back negative. Her full interview will be up on our website at cbs8.com. We'll also have it on our YouTube page. Back to you. And still ahead, we're going to verify whether your four-legged friends can contract the coronavirus. And new findings from the UK, why some doctors believe losing your sense of smell could be a symptom of the coronavirus. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for watching this News 8 special report on the coronavirus. I'm Eric Connert. And I'm Stella Escobedo. With the coronavirus continuing to spread, things are changing quickly, and that is why we are here. We are here to answer as many questions as possible. Stella and I had the chance to talk to cardiologist and Harvard Medical School grad, Dr. Pyle Coley, and she answered a lot of questions for us. Take a listen. Dr. Coley, I want to start with this. We've been seeing articles uh, out of France where researchers there say that they combined the z -Pak with the anti-malaria drug and a 100% success rate. Is this true? Could this be a game changer? I know we want positive news, but not false mm -hmm. hope. Yes, yes, so great question because we heard the president talk about this drug as well in the press conference yesterday. It's called chloroquine. It's been around for over 80 years to treat malaria. And a derivative of this drug called hydroxychloroquine has actually been FDA approved for treatments of lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and other autoimmune conditions. So the reason that we studied this drug in this infection was because it seemed to have some activity against the SARS infection in preventing the virus from entering into the lungs. But the the trial that you're referring to from China that had a, a success rate was a very small study. It only had 36 patients in it, and out of those, only 20 actually received the drug, whereas the other 16 were the control arm where they didn't receive the drug. And as you pointed out, some of them got azithromycin, some didn't, in both the drug arm as well as the control arm. So certainly very promising preliminary data, but I'm not ready to hang my hat on it yet that this is necessarily ready for prime time and ready for us to roll out as a treatment. We had a, a viewer who, who emailed us and says, look, I have a neighbor who has coronavirus. She was out walking around. When I asked about it from a distance, she said she was told it was okay for her to be outside as long as she kept her distance. I can't imagine that's true, but we wanted to run it by you. Yeah, yeah, so I'm a little surprised to hear that as well because somebody with a coronavirus uh, positive infection should really be isolating themselves and wearing the mask. And isolating means staying at home because it's important not so much for yourself because you've already contracted the infection, but to protect others. And there are some studies that came out earlier this week that potentially the virus could even be partially airborne, meaning it lingers in the air for up to three hours even after the person is gone. So I certainly don't think it's a good idea.
for this neighbor to be walking around the community, you know, even if she had a face mask, which it's not clear she did, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. she's exposing others to risk. Okay, Dr. Coley, one more question. We got a, a viewer who sent in a question saying, uh, if you can't inhale a large breath and hold it for at least 10 seconds, it's possible you may have the coronavirus. You know, in these times, people are anxious, right? And sometimes when you have anxiety, you get shortness of breath. How do you know the difference? Is what going around, is that true about holding your breath for 10 seconds? Yeah, that's not true. I haven't heard that. But I will say that, you, that the shortness of breath with coronavirus can be subtle. So here are some kind of tips to keep an eye on. First thing to look for is a change in symptoms. So is anything changing from your usual? Normally you feel winded going up two flights of stairs and now maybe you're getting a little short of breath on the first flight. The second thing to look for is can, are subtle things making you more short of breath? So carrying a bag of groceries, is that making you a little more short of breath? The shortness of breath that you get with the coronavirus, at least in the early stages, can be very subtle, but there's no kind of holding your breath test that will tell us whether or not you're short of breath. It's more something that you'll feel. But I do want to reassure you that it's not something that'll just sneak through and you won't feel it. Mm -hmm. If you're short of breath, you'll be able to you'll tell know. with this okay. virus. Dr. Paul yeah. Coley, yeah. thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate you separating the, uh, the facts from fiction there. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's go over the symptoms of coronavirus again. They include a fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Symptoms may appear in as few as two days or as long as 14 days of exposure. If you're experiencing symptoms, call your health care provider before seeking medical care so that appropriate precautions can be taken. You may have seen posts floating around social media regarding the flu and coronavirus. Some claim that if you have the flu, you can't get coronavirus at the same time. So is that true? Well, here's Jason Puckett with this Verify report. Viewer Chelsea W. sent us this email. She was told if she tested positive for the flu, it was impossible to have the coronavirus at the same time. And she wanted to know if that was true. Well, Chelsea, thanks for the question. To answer, we went straight to the CDC and WHO. So, is it impossible to get the coronavirus if you have the flu? No. A spokesperson for the WHO told us that, quote, it is certainly possible for someone to have more than one virus or other microbial infection at the same time. And when we talked to the CDC, they confirmed you can have both the flu and COVID-19 at the same time. So what would that do to your body? Unfortunately, we don't know right now. The WHO said they're currently researching that exact question. They want to know how the coronavirus interacts with other viruses or sicknesses, but they can't say yet if it puts people at more risk or changes symptoms. Bottom line, Chelsea, you can tell your friend they were wrong. Having the flu doesn't prevent you from getting COVID-19. And that's important. This false idea could lead people with the flu to think they're immune or don't have to take the same precautions to avoid COVID-19. Now, there are a lot of claims and rumors like this one out there. If you see one you want us to look into, send us an email. With your Verify, I'm Jason Puckett. And more health officials are worrying about the coronavirus spreading, especially those people who have the virus, but they don't show any symptoms. Riley Carlson takes a look at what doctors in the UK are learning. <coughs> no one knows the symptoms of the coronavirus better than those who are living with it, like 39-year-old Tara Langston, who's in intensive care in London. Please, none of you take any chances. I mean it. But while people have been asked to watch for a fever, cough and body aches, doctors in the UK say there's something else to look out for. Many of us working across the globe in areas with rising rates of COVID-19 are seeing a big spike in patients who are otherwise completely fit and well, often under 40, presenting with relatively sudden onset and complete loss of smell and taste. Professor Claire Hopkins says ear, nose and throat doctors worldwide have reported more patients with the condition over the last few weeks. Doctors caution these symptoms can be common with other viruses too and say in the majority of cases both senses should come back on their own. Utah Jazz star Rudy Gobert was the first NBA player confirmed to have COVID-19. He tweeted that he hadn't been able to smell anything for four days. And a British health minister who also tested positive says she lost 100% of her taste and smell. Doctors hope these possible clues to help diagnose COVID-19 will encourage more people to self-isolate. I do believe it has the potential to make a difference. A new marker health experts hope may help slow the spread. Riley Carlson, CBS News, London. And this is very interesting information because the more information that our healthcare workers have, uh, the more careful they can be working on the front lines, Eric. 
Thanks, Stella. People aren't only worried about their own health when it comes to contracting coronavirus. Some viewers are wondering if their pets are at risk, too. News 8's Kelly Hesedal went looking for answers in this Verify report. Well, so many people love their pets and consider them part of the family. A viewer contacted us asking the question, can pets contract the coronavirus? Based on evidence so far, the answer is no. Our sources, the CDC, the World Health Organization, published reports, Hong Kong's Agriculture, Fisheries and Conservation Department, and San Diego Humane Society Administrative Lieutenant of Emergency Services, John Peedler. You cannot get coronavirus from your dog or your cat. Your dog and your cat are not the enemy here. Now you're probably wondering, what about that dog in Hong Kong that tested positive for a low-grade infection from coronavirus? Well, the pet hasn't shown any symptoms. Lieutenant Peebler explains. A dog can be a fomite like anything else. So a fomite is just any object that may have any type of contamination on it. Something we deal with a lot in a shelter where a dog toy or a cat toy or a blanket or anything else may have disease on it does not mean that the animal is the carrier for that particular thing. All of our sources, the CDC, the WHO, say it's likely the dog got the virus from a human, and there's no evidence that pets can pass COVID-19 onto humans or other pets. The CDC states while this virus seems to have emerged from an animal source, it is now spreading from person to person in China. There is no reason to think that any animals, including pets in the United States, might be a source of infection with this new coronavirus. To date, CDC has not received any reports of pets or other animals becoming sick with COVID-19. So at this time, there's no evidence that companion animals, including pets, can spread COVID-19. So please, masks for your dogs are not necessary. And please do not abandon your pets. According to Chinese animal rescue groups, there's been an increase in abandoned pets since the outbreak, and pets have been unfairly targeted. The bottom line? People should absolutely not be worried about their pets contracting coronavirus. They are not vectors for coronavirus. They do not have it. Um, pets bring us all joy. Let them continue to do so. So still practice good hygiene, wash your hands after being around pets, livestock and wildlife, just as you normally would do. And if you're concerned about your pet's health, contact your vet. Back to you. The coronavirus is also having an impact on our economy. Still ahead, a financial expert shares advice about managing your money, including what to do with your 401k. And are you without a job right now? The steps you need to take to file for unemployment. This outbreak is having families take a real good look at their finances, like their 401ks. I sat down with a financial expert to help steer us in the right direction. At this point, I would just stay the course because it's going to pop like it's doing today in the market. It's yeah. going to pop back up. And when it does, you'll be glad you stayed the course. You will uh, recover this over time. It's, it's one of those realities of life. It doesn't go up as fast as it went down. It, it's gone down in a month, right? In three weeks. But it'll, it'll recover. We also covered a number of other topics, including credit card debt and student loans. You can check out the full interview on CBS8.com. As the economic impact of the coronavirus spreads, unemployment claims have soared to their highest level since 2017. There are reports of state unemployment websites crashing as people rush to file claims nationwide. Here's what you need to know if you are filing for unemployment. Many young Americans have never dealt with unemployment. It can be a stressful and confusing process to navigate for lots of people, but it doesn't need to be. Unemployment benefits have been part of federal law since the Great Depression, when they were included as part of the Social Security Act, a safety net for American citizens in times of financial turbulence. Nowadays, unemployment benefits are typically provided to people who are out of work through no fault of their own. The process for qualifying and collecting unemployment differs from state to state, as unemployment benefits are managed by the states rather than the federal government. Generally speaking, most states allow people to collect unemployment benefits if they were laid off, quit for good reason, or fired for reasons other than misconduct. A person also has to have worked at their previous job for a certain amount of time and has to demonstrate that they're searching for a new job. But eligibility requirements may be less restrictive right now. The federal government has allowed states to change their laws so people affected by the coronavirus outbreak can receive benefits. People whose hours have been cut or have been moved to part-time may not realize they can apply for underemployment or partial unemployment. This means you could be eligible if your hours were cut to avoid layoffs, but you could normally work more hours. Applying for unemployment and underemployment is generally the same. 
you should look up your own state's laws and application process to find out if you can qualify and apply. As we know, many businesses have shut down, leaving the owners without income and employees without a job and overall making them rethink their business model. Stella has more on how businesses are going online. Stella? You know, Eric, everyone is doing their best to survive right now. And thank goodness for technology, right? The Internet, some people are able to change their business models. And it's working for one woman. Lynn Ingstad is the owner of SoCal Dance in Poway. She says just like everyone else, she had to close her doors, right? So instead of having to completely go out of business and lay off her dance instructors, she took her business online using Zoom and says parents who are home with their kids, they really like this idea so far. Parents are actually loving it um, because, as everybody knows, their kids are home all day long. And so a lot of families are looking for activities to help their kids from being bored and looking for things to do. So we've had a really great response from our families. Um, and more than just the dance education, the kids are missing their friends. Um, and the dance studio provides a community of friends for these kids. And I just pray that the quality of product we're providing will be enough for our students to keep um, keep engaged and keep enrolling because we run the risk of even though this is great, our parents still going to pay for our online services if this continues for weeks. So this isn't a guarantee to stay in business. This is our best effort. So we're really hoping that our families, our families will stay with us. <laughs> Yeah, Eric, as you just heard, this is her best effort. You know, the reality is businesses are in survival mode right now. So hopefully this doesn't last for too long so that they can survive. But, you know, with people losing their jobs and they have to cut back on certain things financially, this might be the first thing that goes. And I also want to say, you know, for, for kids like my daughter, she's an only child right. right now. You know, she's looking for that interaction. You have three kids at home. At least they can play with each sure, other. You know sure. what I mean? So this is this is great. This is a great tool. And Zoom is is really working. Yeah, and getting all that energy out too is so important right now. Yeah, it's getting tricky to find uh, ways to keep them entertained and, uh, and busy right now. A lot of people, a lot of businesses have had to adapt, that's for sure. All right, thanks, Stella. Mm -hmm. Stay with us, everyone. We will be right back. Since the governor ordered Californians stay at home, many of San Diego's hotspots have come to a standstill. Yeah, so we decided to send out our photographer, Kenny McGregor, out with a drone to areas that are usually busy to see what they look like now. So let's take a look. Well, you see those empty beaches, Stella. You see the gas lamp sign, no crowds around it. At, at first, I you're kind of shocked, but then you go, you know what? We're listening. We're listening to the orders. San Diegans are doing their part. That's what I get out of that story. 
totally. We are all in this together. And watching that video too, you go, wow, we live in such a beautiful place. You know, uh, yeah. my uncle lives in Manhattan and he sent me pictures too of it's just completely empty. Vegas, same thing. So yeah, we are all listening. We have to. We're in this together. Yeah, we just got to be patient. We can get back out into the beauty here, hopefully yes. in the near future. You know, with mm -hmm. families cooped up and kids not able to go mm -hmm. on play dates now, neighbors are spreading the love with creative ways to brighten spirits and say hi to each other. News 8's Abby Alford went to Oceanside to check out the displays of neighborhood love. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas in San Diego County in March. Christmas lights bring joy to people. Robert Domowski says after the governor's shelter in place order in a few days hold up in his house, he had to find a way to brighten spirits in his Oceanside neighborhood on South Pacific Street. Without not being able to contact people, just, just uh, people walk by and they'll see them and they might do the same. And this neighborly love has spread across the county. In North Park at Adams in Arizona, Marilyn Schuster shared Christmas lights strung in her neighborhood. In Santee, bushes are lit with blue lights. Lynn Pine in Rancho Del Rey in East Chula Vista is connecting with neighbors with her lights too. Yeah, if you're stuck at home, what a better way to go. Go in the garage, pull out your Christmas lights, put them up. We've shared an Olivenhine neighborhood who says hi each night at 7 with bells. And Escondido Renata Rolls shared how her neighbor in Laurel Valley put up these hearts on sticks to decorate her lawn. And social distancing window hunts are trending. Teddy bears peeking out windows in Santee for children to spot. Even this pup is curious. Patty Bruno de Palma in Rancho San Diego is spreading hope with rainbows. Each are small gestures that make a big connection to unite neighborhoods. Being able to, to go by and see, see the lights, you know, bring a smile to their face and, and say, hey, life goes on. Abby Alford, News 8. I know a lot of people are hurting right now, and you're probably feeling isolated. And if you're like me, you are definitely missing live sports. That's why I decided to come down and take a walk outside Petco Park. So we're going to start a new feature tonight, and I want you to help me out. It's called My Favorite Photo. I want you to send me your favorite sports photo of all time. It can be a famous photo or something very personal to you. I also want you to record yourself on your phone talking about the photo and why it's so significant. Here's an example right now from our own Jake Garrietti. My favorite moment ever captured in a single photo in sports history is the picture of then President George W. Bush standing on top of the mound at Yankee Stadium in 2001, holding his thumb high in the air. Obviously, New York was in its most fragile state, America in its most fragile state after 9-11. I very vividly remember this. I'm seven at the time in 2001. I was seven years old, and I still incredibly vividly remember watching George Bush walk out to throw out that first pitch. And it gives me chills talking about it now because it gave me chills back then, too. The President of the United States. Watching the president of our country walk out at its most vulnerable state, when terrorism is at its highest and the country is at its most fragile, to expose himself to everything and to say that we're not scared, we're not afraid. It was one of those moments where sports absolutely transcended its platform into helping heal a nation. And now he gets out there and it, it, it's just incredible the feeling, the moment, all of it. He gets on the top of that mound and he just zips in a strike. I mean, it's unbelievable. And in that moment, it was kind of like everything was all right. And anytime you get a moment that transcends, it didn't matter whether you a Yankees fan or not. You know, Red Sox fan can say all they want now that they weren't rooting for the Yankees, but everybody was rooting for the Yankees in that 2001 World Series. Didn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, we were all one at that time. And I think that moment has been my favorite because it shows the power of sports. Okay, now it's your turn. I want you to send me your favorite sports photo and a video of you describing that photo to tvsports at kfmb.com. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Outside of Petco Park, I'm Kyle Kraska. We're back with more news right after this. We're missing sports in this town. That's you know for what? sure, here, Stella. We'll
That's for sure. You know what? We'll be back to normal before you know it. I know that people are anxious right now, but just give it some time. It will be okay. I know you love your hockey, so you'll get your hockey. <laughs> exactly. You'll get everything. That's Yeah, I know that's a few months away, but yeah. we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, we've just been doing a lot of playing in the backyard and just being patient and waiting this thing out and doing our part. That's what it's all about, right, Stella? Absolutely. Like I keep saying, we are truly in this together. Well, that's going to do it for us for our Facts Not Fear special report. So glad we were able to answer so many of your questions. You can always get the latest updates at CBS8.com on all of our social media pages or on our News 8 app. Stay safe, everyone. And remember, as Stella said, we are all in this together.